Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for life, for your word, for Jesus, for minds that can commune with you and that we can be here today, we pray in your name. Amen. So it's Thanksgiving Sabbath, so we've got to preach on giving thanks, right? So let's start with the word for giving thanks. You do not pronounce the C-H, ch. It's ch. Eucharisto. Eucharisto. You means good. You know, when you go to a funeral, they read the eulogy. Eulogos is word. You is good. At a funeral, they read a good word. The person could be an absolute scoundrel, but at the funeral, if you never knew them, what you hear is a good word. Well spoken. Good word or well spoken. So you is good or well. And chariseo <clears throat> is um, built on the root word for grace. It's really good gracing or good gifting. That's the word for giving thanks. The word grace is charis, not charis, not charis, um, charis. That's grace, um, for by grace, charis, we are saved through faith. Uh, now, to him who works, I love this verse, we don't use it very often. To him who works, the wages are not counted as charis, grace, but as debt. And the word debt there is the word obligation. So, charis, grace, is a something freely given, whereas when you work for it and you get your paycheck, your boss is obliged to pay you because you've worked. But to him who does not work, but believes, trusts in him who justifies the ungodly, that means there's hope for you and there's hope for me, right? Because we're all the ungodly. His faith is accounted for righteousness, not grace, but debt if you work for it. But if it's free, it's grace. So. Um, Giving thanks is you charis built on the root word of charis, which is grace. To good grace, someone. Um, charisma, we've been talking about the charismas of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit, the gracings of the spirit, spiritual gifts. Um, there are diversities of charismas, but the same spirit. It's all built on that same word for grace. Um, chairo is to rejoice, be glad. Chairo. <laughs> Be glad, rejoice, be gracing. That's, that's the actual root word in the Greek. From which we get the word chara, which I don't think there's any carryover from the Greek chara to our hara, hara, but it sounds like it because it's the word for joy. All right? Charizomai is to grace someone or to show favor to someone and ends up being translated based on context to forgive someone, to grace them. To forgive them. A little word, charito'o, is another form of giving grace to someone. The angel came to Mary and said, Rejoice, one highly favored, highly graced, one good graced. The Lord has blessed you. And Ephesians 1 6 to the praise and glory of his of God's grace, charis, by which he has charisto'od, he has graced us in the beloved. And that gracing, according to the concept, is context is forgiveness and adoption into his family. Um, doesn't go too much further. Soon, hareo. Soon, remember we've talked about that word, it means together. So now gracing together. So when the, when the uh, shepherd found the lost sheep, he said, rejoice, soon, hareo. Rejoice together with me, because I found my, the sheep that was lost. And the woman who lost the coin said, Rejoice together with me, I've found the coin that was lost. And then, Acharistos, got to the, get the emphasis on the right syllable, right? Acharistos is to be ungrateful. Ah is un. You is good, and ah is un. So to be ungrateful or ungracing, for God is kind to the unthankful, the ungracing, and the evil. Um, notice the company of the ungracing is the evil. And then over in um, 1 Timothy 2, 2 and 3, it talks about those who are proud, blasphemers, disobedient, ungracing, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. So if you're not a thankful person, 
you're in some pretty rotten company in the Bible. The evil and the unforgiving and the blasphemers. All right? So there you have it. So the point being that the word for thankfulness is to give gifting or gracing to another. It's not a state of being. It's an act of doing. You can't be giving thanks if you're not giving thanks. <laughs> That's heavy, right? You can't do it passively. You have to do it actively. Now, the word gets used a couple times with Jesus. Jesus took the loaves, feeding of the 5,000, and when he had good graced them, he distributed them to the disciples. So saying, this is why we often will say, instead of saying the blessing over the food, say grace. Well, it's, it's the good gracing of the, of the food. It's, um, that's the word. And then at the Last Supper, he took the cup and he good graced, he eucharistoed, and he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. You know, we call the Last Supper the Lord's Supper. We call it the communion service. If you're Spanish, we call it the Santa Cena, the Holy Supper. But if you're in a formal liturgical church, they call it the Eucharist, the Eucharisto, the good gracing, simply taken from what Jesus did. He Eucharisted the cup, the wine, and gave it to them. So to give thanks. An interesting use of the word is found over when Paul, remember he was a prisoner. <clears throat> He'd been in prison for three or four years. He finally appeals to Rome to, because he's a Roman citizen, because they wanted to send him to Jerusalem for trial. And he knew that the Jews were going to kill him on the way, so he appealed to Caesar. They put him on shipboard, and of course, they sailed too late, and they got in that storm, and for 14 days, they were just blown around in the Adriatic Sea until they came along to the island of Malta, and they were blown into a bay there. The ship is breaking up, and Paul says to the people, you haven't eaten in 14 days. We need some food. He says, God has told me that none of you will lose your lives, but we will lose the ship. Now, it says, and when he had said these things, he took bread and he, Eucharisted, he gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. Get the picture. You're on board a ship which has been blown against the rocks. It's breaking to pieces you need to save your life. There are no lifeboats. That skiff is gone. And Paul says, well, I think we need some nourishment. <laughs> Haven't eaten in 14 days. We've been striving to save the ship. Let's eat. And he offers the blessing. He breaks the bread and he begins to eat. And he said they were all encouraged and also took food themselves. And there were 275 persons on the ship. And they all made it safely to shore. I, I, what an interesting place to stop to say the blessing. The ship is breaking up. The wind is howling. The masts have fallen. It's, you know, save yourself. Jump. You know, find a piece of wood. Float to shore. Hopefully we'll make it. And Paul says, well, we need to eat first. <laughs> And he thanks God for the food and he begins to eat. And it says they were all encouraged. You know, I believe that a thankful heart is a courageous heart. If we are thankful, it causes us to, the word there for encourage is um, euthumos. Thumos is a word for sacrifice. Therefore, it becomes a word for killing the sacrifice. But thumos is really what happens when a, uh, something bubbles over. I wasn't there, but I'm told that my nephew, a few hours before I arrived on Wednesday evening down in Benson for Thanksgiving, had been making some cranberry sauce, a special recipe of his, and he put it on the stove and he put a lid on it and then he got busy doing something. And the next thing you know, there was 
cranberry sauce, sauce was thumosing, thumosing everywhere. It was bubbling out. And um, I actually spent a little bit of time Thursday morning scraping it off the smooth top stove where it was cooked on hard. Because, you know, those smooth top electric stoves, you turn them off, they're hot for another hour, right? So it's baked in. But thumos is, there can be a good thumos, there can be a bad thumos, right? Um, but it's a, it's a bubbling over. And it says, when Paul prayed and ate, gave thanks and ate, they were all, they began to get some new life. And they took food and they all made it. I believe that a thankful heart is a heart that will bubble over. And that's contagious, isn't it? Not just for others, but to yourself. And of course, you can have well bubbling, euthumos, and you can have noxious bubbling, right? That's called grumbling and grousing. So if you're giving thanks, you're going to bubble over well. And if you're grumbling, it's going to bubble the other way. It's going to, it, one will encourage you and the other will discourage you. Our lack of thankfulness is probably a lot to do with our discouragement. Now, there on Malta, Paul Remember, they're building a fire and a, a viper, poisonous snake, grabs onto his, his arm. He shakes it in the fire. They think he's going to fall over dead any moment, and it doesn't even phase him. So now they think he's a god and they want to worship him. He ends up healing a bunch of the people on the... I mean, God did great things on Malta. And you get the feeling by the time Paul the prisoner was put on another ship from Malta to head for Rome... The soldiers and everyone were kind of in awe of this prisoner. It says, after, after three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers, which had wintered at the island. And landing at Syracuse, we stayed three days. From there, we circled around and reached Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew, and the next day, we came to Putioli where we found brethren and were invited to stay with them seven days. I mean, what soldiers are going to let their prisoner hang out with friends for seven days on the trip? You get the feeling Paul was kind of, the prisoner was in charge. They were kind of in awe of him, whatever you want, sir. And from there, we went towards Rome. Now it's on foot. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Appii Forum, and three ends. When Paul saw them, he eucharisted God. He gave thanks to God and he took courage. He's a prisoner. He's heading for trial before a guy named Nero, an absolute psychopathic lunatic. Not a good perspective for a Christian prisoner when this guy is known for killing him by the thousands. But he gave thanks to God and he what? Took courage. I found both of those uses of the word interesting because they both connect with being encouraged, taking courage. We can discourage ourselves by a lack of thankfulness. But by entering into a thankful attitude, giving thanks, instead of grumbling, think about what you might have that's good and thank God for that and thank others for that. Look at other people and instead of grousing about how lousy they are, and we are all pretty lousy in a lot of ways, aren't we? Hard to get along with, difficult. But do we have any good points? If we think about those and we begin to talk those and thank each other and encourage one another, it will build us up instead of tearing us down. Giving thanks is positive. 
Failing to give thanks usually means we're doing the opposite, and that is a negative feedback. I wonder how many people who are depressed could find help from practicing thankfulness. Just might lift us up. All right. So I was looking at the letters of Paul, and I noticed that he starts almost all of them out with a mention of giving thanks. We're going to look at them in order. The first letter that Paul wrote was Galatians. It corresponds with the middle of his second missionary journey. We're not quite sure where he was. Then he wrote the two books of Thessalonians, all during that second missionary journey from Corinth. Then he wrote to the Corinthians from Ephesus during his third missionary journey, wrote them a couple of letters. And just near the end of his third missionary journey, shortly before his arrest, he wrote to the Romans saying, I'm looking forward to coming and see you. Then he was arrested, and while he was actually in Rome, imprisoned, he wrote to the folks in Ephesus, and then Philippi, Philippians, Colossa, Colossians, and Philemon, a man who lived, that's a person, not a town, uh, Philemon. He wrote those letters while he was in prison. He was let out of prison for a little bit, and he did a little more traveling. While he was out of prison, he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus, written to a couple of young protégés. He was re-arrested, put back in the dungeon, the Mamertine prison in Rome, which is a hellhole. And while he was there, he wrote 2 Timothy, the second letter to Timothy, and he says his farewells, and he was martyred shortly thereafter. With that in mind, I find it interesting that the book of Galatians doesn't have any thanksgiving in it. It's the only one. Those pesky Galatians, the people in, the, in central Turkey from his first missionary journey, had allowed themselves to be talked out of the gospel into a works-oriented thing. You can't be saved unless you do. Jesus isn't enough. You've got to add circumcision and feast-keeping and various different things, or you can't really be saved. So salvation really isn't by grace alone. It's by grace plus a few other things you have to do. And Paul says, you guys have lost it. And he doesn't do any thanksgiving that I could find in the book of Galatians. I think he got over that because all the rest of his books have a lot of it. So in 1 Thessalonians, one of the next books he wrote, he says, we give thanks to God always for whom? For you all, making mention in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice he says, I thank God always, what? For you. Now this becomes a pattern. For Thessalonians 2.13, for this reason we thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth the word of God. So th here he thanks God First for them, and then he thanks God that they received the word of truth. I have to admit, it's kind of nice when you preach a sermon to have people feel like, to have people receive it as truth from the word of God, right? Instead of arguing with you. So he's thankful for that. Second Thessalonians, written shortly thereafter, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren and sisters, as is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly. So notice he starts 1 Thessalonians by thanking God for them. And he tells them that. I'm thanking God for you. Is that a message to God or a message to them? Maybe the answer is yes. But here the focus is to the people. He tells the people he's writing to, I'm thankful to God for you guys. We are bound, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord. Notice he's thanking God for people, and he's telling people that he's thanking God for them. Don't miss that. 
This is not, at least in this communication, so much about actually talking to God with thanksgiving, but telling the people how thankful he is for them. Do we do enough of that? Are we thankful for each other? You know, you realize the church throws a bunch of people together that wouldn't be together if it wasn't for Jesus. <laughs> right? Most of us wouldn't even be acquainted if it wasn't for Jesus. Right? And we get to know all these people because we know Jesus and we show up at church and sometimes we're kind of hard to get along with, you know, and we're cranky and we have our issues. And are we really thankful for the people in our church? Do we tell each other we're thankful for each other? Paul seems to do it a lot. First Corinthians, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus. Second Corinthians, this one's a little different. He talks about how they were persecuted and burdened, even despairing of life, end of verse 8. We were sentenced to had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust ourselves but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through the many. Notice here now, he's not thanking them for them. He's actually talking about others giving thanks on behalf of how God has had mercy on him. So he's saying, wow, I'm happy you guys are thanking God for what he's done for me. He saved my life. Back to Romans now. People he's never met. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you. That your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Never met you, but I'm thanking God for you. Right? Ephesians, now he's in prison. I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and of your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Who's he thanking God for? The people in the church. I thank my God, Philippians 1.3, upon every remembrance of you. When I think of you, I start praising the Lord. <laughs> do we say that to each other well I thought of you this week and I just started praising the Lord maybe our relationships would be a little better if we did a little more of that Colossians we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints not quite as direct, but he's thanking God for the people. Philip, Philemon. I thank my God making mention of you always in prayer, hearing of your love and faith, which you have towards the Lord Jesus and all the saints. He wrote some of these letters around the same time, and he actually gives almost the identical wording on some of them. But notice over and over and over again, when Paul writes a letter, he starts out by saying, first of all, I think of you and I start praising the Lord. I am so thankful to God for you. I'm so thankful that you came into my life. I'm so thankful that somehow in the whole Roman Empire, we cross paths. Have you, again, thought about how likely it is that some of us have made connection? And do we tell each other how much we appreciate the fact and we thank God for the fact that we have gotten acquainted? That's pretty important stuff. Now, in 1 Timothy, we're down to the last three letters. I don't find that Paul in 1 Timothy anywhere says, Timothy, I'm thanking God for you. But he does say to Timothy, a true son, the word is genuine, a genuine son in the faith. That's almost as good, isn't it? Timothy, you're my true son. You're not just a friend. You're not just a brother. To me, you're a son. I know I'm not your, your biological father, but you are a genuine son to me in the faith of Jesus Christ. Grace, claris, grace, mercy, peace from God our Father. In 1 Timothy 1.12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me 
because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Here Paul says, I'm thanking God because he called me into the ministry. I'm thanking God because he overlooked my past. I was a killer of Christians, and he turned me into a caller of Christians. Wow, he says, I'm thanking God for his call to ministry. But that's not the usual thanks in Paul. Over and over, he's thanking God for the people. He goes on to say, the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful and worthy saying of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first, Christ Jesus might show all long suffering. He's been patient with me, Paul says, as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. What is he saying? He's saying the way Jesus has treated me is the way he wants to treat you. I was a blasphemer and a murderer, insolent, and he picked me up, turned me around, forgave me, remade me, and that's what he wants to do for everyone. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So here he thanks Jesus for calling him into ministry, and then he ends the passage simply praising God to him, to the king, in immortal, eternal, invisible. 1 Timothy 2, 1-4. to He says, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. <laughs> he says, you ought to be thanking God for everybody. Oh, that's a big... Everybody? What well, says all men? Maybe so I don't have to be thankful for all women? No, sorry. It's all humans. Anthropos. So he's thankful for people and tells them over and over and over again. And he says, now you ought to be giving thanks for everybody. You need to be doing that too. Even for kings and authorities. Oh my. For Nero? For corrupt politicians? This is acceptable and good in the sight of God our Savior who desires all persons to be saved and come. <coughs> And come to the knowledge of the truth. You know what? You better be thankful for that person you don't like. Because <clears throat> if God has his way, he's going to make that person your neighbor <clears throat> in heaven forever and ever and ever. Amen. Isn't that right? God's greatest desire is for your worst enemy to be your neighbor in heaven forever. Because he's crazy about that person you can't stand. So Paul says you need to be giving thanks for everybody. Jesus says love your enemies. I think that would fit in, right? Give thanks for everyone. Everyone is precious in God's sight. Even if you don't like them. Give thanks to God for them. So Paul does it, and then he tells us we should do it. Titus gets a similar treatment to Titus, a true son, a genuine son in our common faith. Grace, mercy, and peace to you. Notice how similar that is to what he said to Timothy, a true son in the faith, my true son in the common faith. Titus doesn't get told... Um, that Paul is thanking God for him, but he gets called the true son. Second Timothy, Paul's last letter, again, he says to Timothy, a beloved son, but he gets around to it. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day. So drop out the middle phrases, I thank God as I remember I thank God as without ceasing, as constantly, I remember you 
in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you. So I want you to notice Paul's thankfulness for people over and over and over and over 10 times. He says, I'm thanking God for you guys, for all of you. I'm bound to give thanks to God for all of you, concerning you. Uh, uh, without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers giving thanks. I mean, he just bubbles over. And I think the thing that struck me the most, again, as I was studying into this the last few days, thinking about it, is Paul isn't just thanking God for the people in his life. He's telling the people he's thanking God for them. That's what matters. So Paul says, now you need to be thanking God for everyone. And tell him. I was praying for you today. I was praying that God help you overcome those sins. I was praying that God would make you a nicer person. I was praying that God would help me love you. It's going to be tough. No. I find it interesting that Paul goes out of his way over and over again to say, I've been talking to God about you and how excited I am, how glad I am that you're in my life, that we have come together in Christ. When I lined all those verses up, I, I was kind of impressed, weren't you? You know, he thanks God that, that he's, he thanks God for people that are thanking God that he has survived the attacks. He, um, he thanks God that people have listened to his sermons. He thanks, but he only has about four times that he's thanking God in other ways. Ten of them. He's thanking God for people. And one of those other four times, he says, you all ought to be thanking God for everybody. Are we thankful for each other? That was really silent. Are we thankful for each other? Do we tell each other? Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you what? Love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Oh yeah, I love them. Did you show them? Did you tell them? Well, no. I was too busy. I was trying too hard. Love one another as I have loved you. By this all will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Some people claim to love Jesus but don't really love their brothers and sisters in the church. How can you love the parent when you don't love the child? You may not like the child, but you better love the child if you're going to love the parent. Right? It's a little hard to say, man, I love you, but I can't stand your kids. That's not going to go very deep. What's the best, one of the best way you can love a parent? Express love for their children. And some of those children are pretty hard to love. But Jesus says, this will be the proof that you've got me in your heart, that you are being discipled by me, is when you love one another. The proof of our discipleship is not the accuracy of our doctrine, not the fervor of our witness, not the steadiness of our attendance at church. The proof of our discipleship is when we're loving one another. And Paul talks to the Corinthians. He says, man, when you guys got factions and arguments going, that's that your faith is bankrupt. You're, you're still carnal. You're still fleshly. You're not pneumaticos. We've been talking about that. You're not 
spirit wind driven. You're fleshly driven. Jesus said, if you love those that love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And of course, you remember to say a tax collector was to use probably one of the most unfriendly innuendos in that society. You know, so you decide what you would put in tax collectors, you know, drug dealers, child abusers, um, gangsters, people in these loan shops, you know, whatever, you know, just look around and say, who, who do I like the least? Well, that's who it is. If you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And we take that verse and we say, oh dear, I got to reach perfection. That's not even what it's talking about. It's talking about loving others the way God loves others. Perfection is when you love even your enemies. And by the way, you can't love your enemies unless you show your enemies you love them. Because love isn't a thing on a shelf. Love is a interaction. Love is an interaction. Oh yeah, I love my enemies. Well, how do you love your enemies? Well, I don't beat them up. But I ignore them. I stay away. So I don't say anything bad. That's not loving your enemies. That's ignoring your enemies. To love your enemies means to engage them lovingly. Somewhere between enemy and dear friend has got to be everyone in the house of the Lord. <laughs> Which means they all fall on the spectrum of we are to love one another. And Paul does it by saying, I am so excited. I want to tell you how much I talk to God about you. And it's not about what's wrong with you. It's about how excited I am that you're in my life. I thank God for you. Wow. Would that help our relationships in our church? In our homes? When's the last time you said to your son or your daughter, I thank God every day for you. Sometimes we're so busy with the nitty gritty of life, we forget that side of it. Tell your husband, tell your wife, Tell your mom, tell your dad. I thank God every day that you're my child, you're my parent, you're my friend, you're my fellow church member. I thank God for you. I have an idea. The next time you think of something critical about a brother or sister in Christ or a family member, the next time you're dwelling on what's wrong with somebody. Stop and say, oh, that's right. I'm supposed to be thanking God for this person and then telling them that I'm thanking God for them. So let's see. What could I possibly know about this person that I could thank God for? Now, it may take some time. It may be hard to come up with anything. But I'll bet if you put your mind to it, there's not a single person in your life that you couldn't think of some reason to thank God for them. Even if it's because they, you know, they caused some disaster which caused you to mature in some way. You know, okay, thank you, Lord, that they wrecked that, but it helped in this area. I'm, I'm sure that if we scratch our brains, we can think of something positive that has resulted in our lives from the interaction with that person. And then thank God for it, and then tell them. I'll bet you'll find that you'll stop bubbling under and start bubbling over. When you stop to give thanks to God, instead of grumbling and grousing, I believe it'll bring you courage instead of discourage. It'll bring you strength in the storm instead of sapping your strength. And I believe that's what the church is supposed to be all about. 
So I guess I want to say that um, I thank God for you all. I'm glad you're all here today. I'm glad you're in my life. I'm glad I've gotten to pass of this church for over 26 years. A lot of longtime friends here. So what I need to make sure is that next week, I've actually thanked God for you in my prayers, which means I remembered you in my prayers, so that I can honestly look you in the eye and say, I talked to God about you last week. And I told him how grateful I am that you're my brother, you're my sister in Christ. You're my friend in Jesus. Jesus, we need an attitude of gratitude. We need more thankfulness. And sometimes we think that's all about just sitting around thanking you for things. And we do need to do that. But I thank you for Paul's example here where he, he thanks you for people and then he tells the people that he's been talking to God in thanksgiving for them. I've been telling God how glad I am I know you. Jesus, would you give us that attitude towards each other today? Yes, may we learn to thank you more in all things and through all things. But may we thank you for each other. May we pray for one another in thankfulness and then tell each other how thankful we are for each other. We pray in your name. Amen.